Let's just take a moment in prayer and ground ourselves in the Christ within. So we give thanks, God, knowing that it is the Christ within us that's the true teacher. So we tune in and listen. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to use our affirmation because we know that in unity we align our thoughts as best as possible with spiritual truth because we know that creates an avenue for spirit to move through us. And we affirm these statements not to make them true, but why? All right, that wasn't very convincing. Okay, because they, why? They, they are, are true. All right, good. Well, we're, we're glad. We're glad to hear that. Okay, so let's align with this. And um, again, you can engage yourself, your energy system. You can do whatever hand motions you want or none or bat your eyes or wiggle your toes or whatever you want to do. So here we go. I am a living, loving expression of God right here and right now. All right, let's do it again. I am a living, loving expression of God right here and now. now. One more time. I am a living, loving expression of God right here and right now. Amen. Amen. All right, we're glad you're here. All right, and it's true. It's true. So we're going to see what there is for us to learn today about this. All right. This is one of my favorite jokes. Anyway, so there's this man who was an avid duck hunter, and he decided it was time for him to get a new bird dog. So he goes out and looking, you know, and sees, wants to find the best bird dog he can find. So he finds one that's quite an amazing bird dog. This bird dog can actually walk on water. And that's how the bird dog retrieves. He walks on the water and gets the duck. Okay, so this man knows that none of his friends are going to believe this. So he thinks, well, I'm just going to have to show them, right? So he takes this one friend of his who's actually kind of a negative sort of guy, but he thinks, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to take him out, and we're going to see what happens. We're going to have to show him this dog. So they go out, and they, you know, they're out in the boat, and the two men and the dog, and they, um, the ducks fly over, and unfortunately, in my mind, they bring a duck down. Anyway... So, the, uh, so the, the man uh, says to the dog, he says, go retrieve it. So the dog steps out of the boat, walks across the top of the water, doesn't get anything wet except his paws, walks across, gets the duck, brings it back. Well, the man's friend didn't say a thing. He didn't say anything. So the man thought, whatever. So they stay out a while longer, then they're ready to go home. So they get in the truck, and they're heading home, and finally, no nope, friend doesn't say anything. So finally the man looks at him, and he says, what would you think about that dog? Pretty good, huh? What do you think? And the man says, I don't know. He says, your dog can't even swim. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Anyway. We, we do that all the time, right? We are standing in the midst of miracles. And all we can say is that dog can't swim. Amazing. You know? And... Jesus Christ's whole message is, look around you, my friend. Look inside you, my friend. The glory of God is right here and right now. The world is filled ablaze with the glory of God. Wake up. Wake up. Because what we perceive depends on what level of life we are perceiving from. And it's true, we live in a paradox. We're divine humans. And remember, I know last week that was good. Hello, human. I'm going to have to tell my friend Lori that I stole her thing and tell her about it. And she'll love that. She'll love it because she likes to share that. Hello, human. So we live in that divine humanity and that human divineness. So we live in paradox all the time. We're living as a manifest expression of spirit. And so what the call is, is always to live in this earthly experience from the level of spirit. To meet whatever happens to us in this world of manifestation, this world of experiences, this world of appearances. Because <clears throat> it's happening in the manifest world. It's not that it's not happening. It's not that it's not real. It is real. 
and it's real at the level of materiality. And when we come from that place of spirit, what we find is that we are filled with resource, we are filled with power, we are filled with love, we are filled with abundance, so that everything, we can meet it. We can uh, actually have a new experience of ourselves and we can meet those conditions and actually experience them as opportunities to grow, as opportunities to transform. Now it takes some work, right? It's a lifelong journey, and it's a lifelong willingness to learn how to see differently. It's a lifelong journey of learning how to transform our emotions, how to deal with what hurts us, what pains us, what scares us. You can't just snap your fingers and make it go away. That's not how it works. And yet it does work. If we're willing to keep tuning into the power, we can have a new experience of ourselves. We can learn. It's sort of like cell by cell, thought by thought experience by experience, we can learn and we can see things differently. Uh, Emmett Fox, that great metaphysician, uh, today the reading in his uh, book, Around the Year with Emmett Fox, it's a daily reader that somebody excerpted a lot of different things that he wrote from his uh, various mini books that he wrote. <clears throat> and today's reading just happened to be just about this. How about that? And it was, he said, it's like as if a person who uh, was had the experience of, of not being able to see color and not being able to have the sense of smell working fully. It's like they're in a beautiful garden filled with colorful flowers and flowers that smell wonderful, but they can't perceive the color and they can't smell the smells because they, in that situation, physically there's just something that's, that's not functioning to let that happen. And yet, he's making that analogy, which is true, that that's how a lot of times we're walking around in these miracles, and we can't see the colors, and we can't see, we can't smell the wonderful smells, but it's not that we can't, it's that we maybe don't know that we can, but we have the opportunity to learn that we can do that if we're willing to turn our attention Godward towards, again, not some God sitting off on the cloud in the sky, but that God, that life that is who we all are, that life that we're all an expression of. And when we do that, literally our lives transform, our lives change. So what we start to see is that when we have sickness, yeah, we have to face it, it's not comfortable. I'm not saying it is. And yet, it really, really is an opportunity to understand what wellness is all about. How many of you, and you can even raise your hand if you want to, that when you have gone through physical challenges that you have, and you may or may not have gotten the quote, 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 cure, but you still, when you faced it and dealt with it, that you learned something about what it means to be well? Right. And maybe you learned some new habits, or you learned some new sense of well-being from inside yourself. Or when you had the experience of having financial difficulties, that you, when you faced it and you did the best you could and you moved through it, did you learn something about what abundance really is? Absolutely. When you had somebody with amen in out there, I think, okay, I, mean, I can amen on that one. Okay. When you've had trouble in your relationships, when there's been conflict or alienation or hurt or wound or people, you know, somehow being cruel or violent to each other, but you faced it one way or the other and you worked through it for yourself, have you learned what it means to really be wise and loving? Nobody got any hands on that one. Okay. <laughs> No, I didn't. No. <laughs> I'm working on it, okay? All right. When we see violence in our communities or in our country or in our world, but we're willing to face it, and we're willing to face it, and we're willing to see what can I find in myself to deal with this? What can I find in other people? Are we learning that, wow, look at this. That's not how we're supposed to treat each other. Are we learning that we're all one? I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So everything that we experience in our outer lives, in our human lives, is an opportunity. And it doesn't mean that you're always happy about it or that it feels good. I, I don't think it's anywhere in here where Jesus says you have to like something or feel good. I've never seen that in there. Okay. But it's always, 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 always the call is to come to it from a place of power. And the miracle is that once we do that, we do start to feel better, right? And we do start to like ourselves a lot better. And conditions, one way or the other, shift and transform so that life becomes more 
pleasing for us. It becomes more fulfilling. It becomes more of what we really want to be living. That's the opportunity, and that's what we are called to do. Because what happens is when we're willing to look Godward, when we're willing to come from that God place, is we transform how we see ourselves and how we understand ourselves. We stop thinking we're this poor, pitiful, helpless people. That goes away. And we start to really experience, oh, I got some power here. I can make some choices. There's some stuff I can do here to make my life better. We start to understand more fully who other people are. They're not our adversaries. They're not people, things to be scared of. But they are our brothers and sisters, and we can find ways to interact wisely with them so that the good comes forth. And we start to understand differently what life's all about. It's not this hard veil of tears we can learn that it can be fulfilling and that we're here to learn and we're here to grow. This is earth school, friends. And we're here to build consciousness. We're here to appropriate, in a sense, um, that, th that God awareness and make it individualized in our own lives. We live, move, and have our being in God. And it, it'll keep you breathing, but it's not going to do you a whole lot of good until you make it real for you, right? Right? Until you make it individualized for you, that's when it really does you the most good. God loves all of us, and God's always loving us, and God's always inviting us to let that be really real for us. Let that be true. Let it open our hearts and our minds. Let it, let it make us uh, new creatures in Christ, to coin a phrase from the Apostle Paul. Ha -ha. Okay, he coined that one. All right. But, it becomes, but we become understanding of who we are, and we are lifted up, just like we were hearing. And that song that we sang, um, both of them that we sang are this morning, first off, God, I want to see you. That's the deal. I want to see God. I want to see God in, not in myself. I want to see God in other people. I want to see God in this colorful garden called life. And I am a sanctuary. That is who I am. And I want to know that and live from that place one day at a time the best that I can. So I'm going to share with you this scripture. This is a really profound scripture. It's the, it's the scripture about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask David to put our picture up here. That I took that picture um, in January when I was in the Holy Land. That's a photograph of the Church of the Transfiguration. It's on Mount Tabor which is um, in the area of the Lake of Gal the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Genesaret, it's the same lake. And um, it's considered, again, different people have different opinions about where the transfiguration took place. But Mount Tabor kind of wins, in a sense. It, it's what traditionally has been thought to be the place where the transfiguration took place. So this is the outside of the Church of the Transfiguration, and it's a Catholic church uh, run by the Franciscan Order. So I'm going to read a little bit here, and then I'm going to ask David to show us the next picture. So in this uh, scripture, uh, and this is like not a tall, tall, tall mountain, but it's a, it's a big hill. Anyway, depends on where you're from. Anyway, so, um, so in this uh, reading here, this is what happened. This is the, the, let me give you a little context to this. In the preceding chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, it's talking about how the Sadducees and the Pharisees actually came up from Jerusalem to see, talk to Jesus up in Galilee. Now, that was quite a trip for them. That was several days, a couple of hours in a car today. For them to walk up there, that was a several-day trip. They really wanted to talk to him. They made a long journey up there. Um, from Jerusalem up to Galilee to talk to him. And he had been going around um, doing miracles and all this kind of thing. I guess they were thought, we better talk to this guy some more. And he had also, right before this experience that I'm going to share with you here in a minute, that he'd been talking with his disciples and he'd been telling them about, you know, there's going to be some things that happen. It may not be so pleasant for a while here. It's going to seem like maybe... Um, uh, all that we've been talking about isn't going to work out, but he, hang in there, God is coming. And he said, I want you to uh, see, what's, see this, see the deep spiritual reality. That's what transfiguration is about. It's about, God, I want to see you. It's about seeing the deep spiritual reality that is within us. It's about allowing ourselves to feel and to know our spiritual life. This experience of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, you can take it literally, you can take it 
uh, symbolically, you can take it metaphysically, you can take it mystically. I like to take it on all those levels. So you can see it however you want to. The main thing that matters about it um, is that anything that Jesus Christ ever did, he was never doing it about himself. It was never about, I can do this, but the rest of you, good luck. It was never about that. And it was always about, this is how it is for all of us. I'm going uh, before you to show you the way. I'm going before you to open the way. I expect you to do what I'm doing and greater things. I expect you also to be transfigured on a daily basis, right? Transfiguration simply means to become aware of the glory of God that's within you and to let that express through you. That's what it means on a daily, momently, hour-by-hour basis to grasp the reality and the power of the spirit within you and to let that be real for you to make a difference as you go forward in your life. So as I read this scripture about the transfiguration, I'm going to ask David to put our next picture up there. That is inside the church. It is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I think it's a mosaic, not a painting. Um, I took that, and there you see Jesus in the center uh, raised up. In his dazzling, you see uh, Moses and Elijah on either side of him, and uh, you see the apostles around him. And um, underneath that is the altar of the church. So that's way up. You walk right in, and there it is. It's absolutely gorgeous. It takes your breath away. It really does. And David, would you put the final picture up? This is just a close-up of that very same thing. It's just gorgeous. And... Um, you can see the dazzling gold all around it. So just keep that in mind, and again, however you want to see that, at whatever level or multi-levels, and, and hear this scripture. So six days later, and this is after Jesus has been talking with uh, various people and talking with his disciples, Jesus took with him Peter, who stands in the 12 powers for faith, James, who stands for wisdom, and his brother John, and John stands for love. So he took faith, wisdom, and love with him. That's significant, right? To go up and, and ex have this experience. And so, his, uh, and so he led them up a high mountain by themselves. So they go off, I mean, and symbolism of a high mountain is always a uh, high consciousness, a God consciousness. I'm leaving all the, the clatter and the clamor behind, and I'm going up into a high consciousness by myself with the awareness of my Christ nature, of my 12 powers, because I am going to experience my spiritual life. Okay, and so he was transfigured before them. It means his appearance changed. Something amazing happened. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Ooh, think about that. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now that's significant on many levels. On one level, what it's uh, sig signifying to the people of the day and to us too is that he was approved of by these very significant people and these very significant prophets from the Jewish religion, from that legacy. Moses, the lawgiver, approved of him. Elijah, the miracle man. Elijah was the miracle man. He was always doing miracles. He was a great prophet. He approved of Jesus. The coming together of the law and the miracles were saying yes. And there's Jesus in the middle, right? The I am, the expression of the here and now, the expression of today you are seeing the law and the miraculous presence of God fulfilled in your presence. Again, not about the personality of Jesus, but about the I am, that which is in all of us, the Christ nature that's in all of us is fulfilled always right here and right now. And the transfiguration is inviting us to realize that, to know it, and to let that matter to us, let it be real for us. Okay, so then Peter said to Jesus, and this is, I think this, okay, this is the funny part. All right, here's the comedy, all right. Then Peter, said, then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, why that's funny is it, that's, that's the human nature, saying, this is really good. 
let me build a building for it and make a structure and make a monument and, and make an organization here and make rules and we can contain that, that sucker, right? <laughs> ah! <sighs> that's what we do. And, st- and that's part of the dilemma. That's the divine human dilemma. The human wants to make some rules about this sucker. I've noticed that that didn't work with, with religion. Have you noticed that? What, what we're called to do is to find a way to, yes, we have to have a container for it, but the container is our own life. Charles Fillmore, the, the co-founder of our unity movement, he used to talk about that all the time. He said, God didn't tell anybody to create some church with all this structure and all these rules. Guess who, Charles said, guess who the church is? It's you. It's you as an individual. You're the church. You're the place of the Holy Spirit. That's you. Of course, we can come together in community and we can find ways to organize ourselves and have boundaries and guidelines, but not to make rules about what you have to think, and how you have to be, and who's in and who's out. It's not in there. People, people made that up. People said, let, let me build you a dwelling. And did Jesus say, yes, Peter, that's a wonderful idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did not. Okay, so then the next verse is, while Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. I think that's good. It's like, shut up, Peter. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know. That's not what he said, but I, anyway. Okay, so while, he was, while Peter was still speaking and going on with his plan, forwarding his plan here, um, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, just what I already read today, but from a different part of Matthew, This is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's what it says. Listen to him. God's saying, listen to the Christ in you. Listen to that aspect of your life that is so powerful. And so when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, and they were overcome by fear. Interesting. Interesting. Do you ever get scared when you hear God talking to you? I do. Not because God's scary, but because I'm, I'm like, I can't do that. That's too much. You want too much, God. And God's always saying, nah, I'm with you. It's okay. Just take it a bit at a time. I'm with you. It's not all about you figuring this thing out. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, get up and don't be afraid. Because Jesus knew it was God and that God was with him. And then they looked up. And they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Powerful. So that's what happens for us when we have, and it it may be a mystical experience. Sometimes we have mystical experiences. It doesn't have to be that. It can be just a pretty normal, everyday experience. But but that realization that the power of God is with us and and the Christ in us, again, in this expression of Jesus is saying, it's okay, get up, you don't need to be afraid, it's okay. And you find yourself there with your Christ, and you come back to that place. And allow yourself to go forward, though, not saying, well, that was weird. Whew, boy, I'm glad that's over. Okay, no, take it in and say, yeah, that's real. That's a part of life. This experience of real values, this experience, maybe it is a mystical experience. Maybe it's simply an experience of knowing that I'm whole and well, or knowing that I'm one with abundance, or knowing that I'm one with love, or knowing that I'm one with my neighbor. Whatever it is, it can be, well, mystical, or it can be pretty simple. It doesn't make any difference, or oftentimes it's all the above, or sometimes one and sometimes the other, and sometimes all in between. The main thing is to let it be real for you. You know, yeah, God is there. God, the spiritual aspect of myself and the aspect of life is very, very real. And that's absolutely wonderful. And I'm going to take that and go forward in my life. And I'm going to let myself be a little bit more expanded today. And we just do that one bit at a time, one day at a time. And we find ourselves growing and growing and growing. So how do we do that? How do we create that experience of transfiguration for us so that we experience in ourselves that and of whatever other imagery that we have of that? That's about me. That's not about, wow, Jesus, that was good. That's not what that is. That's about, wow, wow, look at what's in me. It's powerful. And I can incorporate that image, or if I have another image, I can know that's who I am, and I can live that. So we do it certainly by making that daily conscious contact with God 
And we do it by making choices. We do it by making choices to do something different than perhaps what we had experienced before. And this is a reading that I like a lot. It says, be the person that breaks the cycle. Be the person that you needed when you were hurting, not the person who hurt you. You vow to be better than what broke you, to heal instead of becoming bitter, so that you can act from your heart, not from your pain. If you were judged, then choose understanding. If you were rejected, then choose acceptance. If you were shamed, choose compassion. And you can write your own list, right? So what we're called to do is to wake up, to find that dazzling sun inside of ourselves, to make that conscious communion with God, and to make choices that lift us up, that let the light shine. And when we let that light shine in us, it not only makes us uh, feel better and have a better quality of life and opens doors for us. You know what it does. Everybody else can see it, right? And it reminds them about who lives in them. Amen. And it is the Christ, the I Am. Let's pray. Mother, Father, God, we're grateful today knowing that we are lifted up. We're grateful for our brother Jesus Christ for his willingness to do the work to find you within him and to let it shine. Thank you, God, that you are that same light in us and that we, too, are doing the work and we are shining. And so it is. Amen.